Uh, we're just having an Today's awkward Saturday staring night. session at this point, so I'd say we just get started. Does that sound? All right. So um, these are our panelists. I'm going to let them say a little bit about themselves, just going down the road here. Uh, start with you. Uh, my name is Ray Kelly. I've been doing uh, application security specifically for about 20 years now. So uh, had my hand in a couple of uh, web application scanners uh, that we sold to people. Uh, so essentially hacking websites. I'm Johnny X, and I'm an impoverished student again, computer science, astrophysics, double major, and um, yay. And um, I helped start the EFF track many years ago, and the skeptics track, and I used to run the space track and the science track, and and uh, I haven't been here since 2018, so it's good to be back. And I have googly eyes, by the way, for anybody who wants them. <laughs> I'm Andrew Hirsch. I'm a professor of computer science at University of Buffalo, uh, and I focus on uh, program languages and security uh, through the lens of program languages. So, I'm Isaac Sheff, and uh, technically my PhD is in programming languages, but these days I do industrial research in distributed systems. Oh, I forgot to mention, I'm sorry, because this is really good. Um, I'm here as the social engineering expert, which means I'm, I guess I'm good at bullshitting people. Uh, you'll never know. What's so that bullshit? You'll never know. That's for you to determine. Yes. Uh, I'm Dustin Smith. I uh, ran an IT company here in Atlanta for about 10 years, then moved up to Washington, D.C. area, and I'm doing government contracting now. So, uh, I don't have a shiny PhD or anything like that, but eh, I can hold my own. All right, uh, so to each of you, uh, what does hacking actually mean to you? Start down the line? Yes. Uh, so, hacking to me means uh, breaking shit. That's, uh, that's what I find fun about it. So, uh, being able to take something like a website and make it do things that it wasn't supposed to. <laughs> Uh, so uh, for me, that's where the fun comes in, trying to, to break things, you know, other people's work and, uh, you know, helping them out and finding those vulnerabilities. For me, it's exploring complex systems, not necessarily computers, but any type of complex system and figuring out how to do fun, creative, um, not maliciously destructive things with them, especially if they're things that the designers never envisioned or imagined. For me, it's all about making a system, usually but not always a computer system, violate its policies somehow. So two major ways of doing that are a confidentiality attack. I got your secrets that you didn't expect me to get. And an integrity attack. I made you do something you didn't want to do. That's cool. Neat. Yeah. I want to play with that later. Yeah. But I'm right here. And I believe uh, part of yeah. Oh, all right. Hacking 101? Yeah. All right. Great. Well, yeah. um, I, can, I can give you my seat and show the mic. It's fine. Well, you got here at the right time. We're doing introductions. How about that? I guess I would say, and it's not that different from what's been said so far, using technology, whatever technology means, for purposes for which it was never intended by its creators. That could be malicious, it could be destructive, uh, could not be. I think you'll need to share your mic. Right. Yeah. Introduce yourself, stranger. Well, I guess I got here just in time. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Kurt Opsahl. I am the Deputy Executive Director and General Counsel with the Electronic Frontier Foundation. EFF is a nonprofit organization. Oh, thank you. Good work. Uh, Good work. Dedicated to defending your rights online. So we fight for free expression, privacy, uh, innovation, trying to do things through uh, uh, litigation, impact litigation, grassroots activism, freedom enhancing technologies sent out through open source. And in particular for, for this panel, one of the things that I work on is I lead up our Coder's Rights Project, where we provide free legal advice to security researchers uh, about the legal risks involved with doing the research and to address issues that arise when they want to disclose that research. Sometimes when the, uh, the vendor, for example, is not wanting to see uh, public discussion of the flaws involved in their discoveries. Uh, so, anyway, and it's great to be here. Okay. Uh, to the actual uh, hackers, uh, what would you say is your best hack? 
and to the lawyer, what was the best hacking case that you ha that you can actually talk about a little bit? And we'll start with Ray here. Me? I always go first. Okay, let's start with the lawyer. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, so what is the best hacking case that I was in, involved with? Well, uh, oh, one that comes to mind, uh, well, was fun because it was just a fun hack, was uh, a hack of a uh, fancy, like, man-sized safe. And uh, it was, uh, uh, they did some research on it, found how to get inside this uh, supposedly highly secure safe. Uh, and... Uh, uh, well, there was some tension around uh, the the manufacturer of the safe did not like the idea that you know people could uh, could get into that, and it was a bit of a challenge as well to find ways to mitigate against it because once the safe is out there, it's um, you know, it's hard to replace. But uh, they were able to work it out with the with the vendor and went ahead with the presentation. So uh, I guess all's well that ends well, and it was just a fun hack. Um, but you know, a lot, of, a lot of the work that we're doing is well. The fun part is, uh, I'll give you another example. This was happening. Someone uh, did a fun hack at this past DefCon. Uh, the interesting part was they jailbroke a uh, John Deere tractor controller, um, and uh, you know, John Deere is somewhat famously is against the right to repair and does not like to have other people be able to uh, put different software uh, on their machines. Uh, and this is, you know, trouble for a lot of farmers who would like to be able to repair their machines without having to take it to a John Deere dealership or maybe make their own differences and enhancements on, on how it operates or continue to use old ones. So that was like the, the cool part, but the hacky cool part was then, of course, they made it play Doom, as you do. And it was farming Doom, so you're driving around this tractor that's acting like the chainsaw on Doom, and so you just like run at other creatures. And to get health, you have to like cut down uh, the, the plants. So anyway, that was a good hack. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> wow. You and I said that. All right, well. I think uh, you two are the real hackers, so maybe it's uh, up to you two next. Uh, I can take a shot. So uh, kind of one of my favorite ones um, I wasn't involved in, but this was uh, during the Cold War. And uh, so near the White House, there was a hotel where important dignitaries would stay, right? kings, presidents from other countries, and they would stay there. And uh, the hotel rooms were kind enough to provide these, uh, these dignitaries with paper shredders because when you're important, you're traveling, you have to be able to shred you know, your papers. Uh, the problem was these were made by some three-letter government acronym from our government <laughs> uh, that made the paper shredders. And what they did is they actually built a scanning device at the top. So as they're shredding the documents, it's reading it. It was actually sending that's the... That's evil and brilliant. I, I was like, that's awesome. Oh. Uh, and they were sending that over, actually, because there was no, uh, you know, there's no SD cards back then. There's no Wi-Fi. So what they were doing, though, was just barely touching the, the electrical line, like little pulses through the electricity, basically like an old school modem, like da 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 da, -da. Oh. And in another room in the hotel, they're just rebuilding <laughs> these documents that every, everything that's being shredded. And I thought that was pretty cool. Oh, wow. <laughs> I, okay, this isn't nearly as good. This is social engineering bullshit. Um, I got, I was a DJ at a large FM radio station uh, for most of the 90s and the early 2000s. Uh, won a bunch of listener awards. The station, I had a uh, prime time listening spot show, good audience. Um, station itself covered most of Middle Tennessee, Southern Kentucky, Northern Alabama. It took Vanderbilt University about five years to realize that I wasn't student or faculty or staff or administration. I really had no business being there. But by then, I'd won awards. And I was their top trainer, and they couldn't really fire me, so they made an exception. Just you're up. Well, I, I mean, so I, as somebody who doesn't do a lot of hacking myself, I generally prevent hacks rather than create them. Um, but I, I can tell you a little bit about, uh, well, maybe I'll join you in the so, uh, social engineering bullshit, one of my favorite uh, hack stories. Um, there's a very, very famous company called RSA, uh, which is yeah, yeah. one of the best security companies in the world, very famous. Um, until one day, somebody did, I forget exactly what it was, but they did one, uh, the moral equivalent of calling up 
uh, one of the higher up secretaries, you know, one of these people that actually run the organization, uh, and said the equivalent of, um, hi, I'm the password inspector. I need to make sure your passwords are secure. Can you tell me what they are? And then they got a bunch of uh, uh, keys that were actually used in the real world for uh, hardware-based security. So um, <laughs> they great. had to do a big recall of that product. Do you remember which product it was? Or are you, uh, you say? I, 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 I know it was a USB-based uh, authentication system, and I don't know which one, because <laughs> they do several. The weakest link is usually insider threat. Very, very cool. All right, so what's next? Did, was there some sort of official, like, charity-type announcement thing we were supposed yes. to do? Uh, we've got the charity Open Hands. I think that's what it's called. Is that, is that what it's called? Yeah, Open Hand. Uh, so donate to it. Dragon Con is doing some sort of a match. I have not heard what that match is this year. Dollar for dollar, up to $100,000 for each dollar raised turns into two. I'm just reading the copy on the okay, back. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> the food charity, right? Uh... Paxton delivers yeah. nearly 5,000 yeah. meals per day, so I'm guessing yes. Yeah. So, Hunger sucks. Poverty really sucks. Yeah. You yeah. good people. So, if, uh, we're, we're not going to pass it around like a collection plate, but if you want to come up here and donate, you're more than welcome to do so. And completely unrelated, because I don't think we can like give out stuff uh, if you donate to the charity, especially if we're not associated with yeah. it. But I will be more than happy to provide googly eyes to anyone <laughs> who wants to come up and toss some bucks in. I got a whole bunch of googly eyes. Just for Dragon Con, and I don't want to go home with any. Okay. Right, take it away, buddy. Oh, that's fine. Um, well, I mean, we talked about the hacks and stuff like that. Why don't we go ahead and get down to brass tacks and do some presentations and teach people how to do shit? How does that sound? I'm going to let you guys decide who wants to go first. It does not matter to me. Well, um... If you guys want to go, we have some rather uh, involved demos to do, uh, okay. but we're happy to, if you guys want to go first. We'll, uh, I don't have one. Oh, you don't have one? Right. Okay. Uh, I got a, a quick and easy, pretty low-tech one. There um, if there's any way we could get a picture of this and put it up on the monitors, I probably should have asked in advance, but if not, um, I think I can explain stuff pretty clearly. Um, back here. in the... I will try. Oh, okay. It's going to take some steps of indirection here, but we'll see what let's, we can do. Let's try with that one. Make yeah, sure you get the ribbon in there. That's okay. important. Okay. All right, so the, if I remember correctly, the first real um, panels for the Proto EFF track were in 1998. They let us do one a day, I think, to kind of a proof of concept before they gave us a full track. And the Dragon Con badges were quite different back then. Um, everybody got the same badge. It was a laminate, and you had a ribbon on here uh, to tell if you were had a ribbon to tell if you were a guest or a director or staff. Um, even uh, Pat Henry you know, just had a ribbon to distinguish him from everybody else. And the badges didn't really have a whole lot of security on here. The holograms were something you could buy and stick on uh, or laminate over, I forget which. And um, we, uh, Scott is great, by the way. He's been running the EFF track for a long time. But the guy before him we had some issues with. So we, being the Nashville 2600 organization, 2600.com and 2600 Magazine, if you're not familiar with it, um, look them up, Google them. Uh, they've been around forever. And um, so we had some issues with the previous um, director, and we thought, well, if Dragon Con fucks us over after putting all this work into it, we really need a um, uh, burn the bridges, burn everything to the ground, and salt the earth plan. And the plan we came up with was the badges, um, anyone attending Dragon Con would get a badge, and they would get exactly the same badge no matter what their position was in the con, staff or attendee. The ribbons, you can order these things from pretty much any trophy shop, and the more you get, the cheaper they get. So for about 1200 bucks, we could get about 5,000 ribbons, and this was back when Dragon Con attendance was about 15, 20,000 people. And we figured the first day we would be doing kind of proof of concept test runs with it. And the ribbons would say things funny on them like, drunk, horny, stupid, need beer, you know, blah, blah, blah. We came up with a list of about 300 of them, most of them courtesy of um, uh, 
Dragon Con staffer who shall remain unnamed, but they are very, very, very extremely smart and funny, and Dragon Con should be glad they still have them, even if I'm not going to name that individual. So if that went well, our plan was to basically, um, there were a lot of free stuff tables where, pe where people would put flyers or just weird, you know, flyers for other cons or weird stuff, and we would leave them out there um, on the first day and see how well they were picked up. Second day, we were going to start flooding the convention with thousands of guest ribbons and director ribbons. And on the back would be printed instructions like, guest ribbon gets you into the VIP room and free drinks, and they don't check attendance rolls. Director ribbon will get you into any part of the convention if you simply act confident and walk past security waving your badge at them. <laughs> Run amok, have fun. And the way to distribute those without getting caught, we figured, would involve stupid, simple, cheap costumes that we didn't care if they were particularly good or not, as long as your face was covered. And the main point of distribution, um, along with the free swag tables, would be the bathrooms. We would simply go into each bathroom and distribute them in the bathroom, walk in, drop them, go into a stall, quickly change into a different, cheap, but easy to carry costume in your backpack with a different um, face covering on it, do it during um, changes in uh, panels when there was a lot of foot traffic around, hang out, you know, take a dump if you need to, read a book, whatever. And by the time people started going back through security footage, they'd have to be checking thousands of individuals to try, to try to find the one who went in and didn't come out and the one who came out but they didn't find going in. And especially if you had a third cheap and easy costume in your backpack, that when you walked out of the hotel, you pull the mask off, turn your shirt or your um, uh, hoodie or whatever inside out, go into another hotel and stick on another costume. You can do this stuff all day. So we figured that would be, um, if we got screwed over, that would be our revenge, and we would sit back and document the chaos and chuckle. And I'm telling you this now because absolutely will not work now. So. Although I may show up next year with just some novelty retro ribbons to leave around places. So um, there you go. Um, I was thinking maybe for Hacking 201 we could discover some of the security features and the, the new badges. And um, uh, yeah, not necessarily you know, trying to screw over the convention. I personally want to keep the reality tracks going as long as possible. And if I cause too much chaos, I might shut them down out of spite. But um, I think DragonCon would be appreciative if we found flaws and notified them. I'm done. Okay. Shall we? <coughs> All right. So we think we're going to try something. We should probably put on masks if we're going to go. Yeah. That's that involves getting up off stage. Okay, so I think we need one volunteer, two? We need two. One we need to be a client. Yes, so we need a couple of volunteers to help us run some stuff. Somebody there? Anybody else brave enough to come up? All the way in the back, come on up. You get the first free googly eyes when you're done. <laughs> <laughs> we will not be hacking anybody's personal devices tonight. Well, not yet. Well. Tomorrow night's a different story. All right. So one of you will be a laundromat called Laundry.com. Which one of you will it be? All right. You, sir, are Laundry.com. You run this website, but most importantly, you are the only being in the universe that can affix Laundry.com digital signatures to web pages. Other people can write websites that look much the same as this one, but you are the only one in the universe who can do that. So. If you, a client, wish to log into laundry.com, you might request a web page to which you would affix a digital signature. Yep. And request a web page. And you uh, affix a digital signature. Well, so just need take something here. Uh, okay. Hold on this. Hold on. That, hold that. So you can just. If you just give him the uh, login page so we'll and simulate you, the internet here, and you can log in, 
You might enter your login details on such a web page. Please don't put a real password unless you want to be hacked. <laughs> Somebody has a classic suggestion. <laughs> the same as my luggage. Wait a second. <laughs> and then you might find that in the inner workings of this here web page, the form specifies that it needs to be returned to the laundry.com server. So upon filling it out, you might send it back to laundry.com. At which point, having logged in your user, you could send to them, complete with a digital signature, their laundry. So if you affix a digital signature from your pad thereof, just, just take it off and put it on. And that's how the system is supposed to work. Now, on a good day, that's exactly what happens. But we're going to simulate for the moment a man in the middle attack. So let's suppose that I am an evil and malicious person. And uh, I've sent you an email. And I told you that there's something wrong with your laundry and you need to log in immediately. Now, I can't make laundry.com digital signatures. So these days, what people tend to do is find a similar looking name. So I am Landry.co. <laughs> All right, so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to request a login page from laundry.com. I'm going to pretend to be a user of same. So if laundry.com affixes their digital signature and sends me a login page. Uh, affix need, your digital uh, signature. I need the signature. Oh, this is very yep. important. It's very important that you sign everything. Otherwise, who knows where, who it might be coming from? Well, we can do this a step <laughs> worse. Excellent. Then, um, then I can see what this is supposed to look like. And I can put this in a copy machine because it's the digital world. We can copy and paste. And I can have a web page that looks exactly the same. But uh, I'm going to change something under the hood. This is not going to be returned to laundry.com. This is going to be returned to me at laundry.co. And that means that I can't affix laundry.com digital signature anymore. I don't have that power. But I can affix a laundry.co digital signature. And I can hand it off to the user. And they can enter their username and password. Which point I've still got this laundry.com page, this laundry.com page open properly in my own web browser. And it's just waiting. And once I've gotten the username and password returned to me, I know what they are. And that means, uh, if you don't mind me borrowing the pen, that means uh, I can copy them over into my version of the web page. <laughs> if I can read it. <laughs> Computers are much better at that than we are. Now, laundry.com gets this, and then check, is that the right username and password? Does that look right to you? All right, well, and here's it, his dirty laundry. If it is, then I can retrieve the user's dirty laundry. <laughs> and all of the secrets are now with our attacker here. So. Now, I would point out there is one addendum to our story. One of the reasons that we use these digital signatures, HTTPS, or those locks in the upper left-hand corner of your web page these days, is because although you can draw as many locks on the web page as you like, that's the one part that can't actually be forged. So before we had those, and you'll still see these on some websites that are bad at keeping up to date, we had these. Regular old URLs would uh, sometimes show up with HTTP and no S, and sometimes they even give you, like your web browser will show you a lock with a slash in it or something. And the beautiful thing about these is that they can pass through the copy machine. So if I have control of your internet connection, if I'm a malicious Wi-Fi node or uh, really or anyone between you and the server, I can just pretend to be laundry.com. And that makes this whole thing much easier. Or if you're just Johnny X and willing to trick people. <laughs> I admit nothing. <laughs> well, Not everything. Thank you both. You uh, have been man in the middle. That was a very good explanation. Uh, yeah, hey, I get your eyes. I don't want to go home with these. Take some eyes. Now, come here. Come here. Take them. How many do we take? As many as you like, dude. I would <laughs> add. You can have all of those. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> you don't have to do that. Really. I was kidding. Just leave me enough for hacking 201 and we're good. So uh, you know what happens, though? If, if you're not on the Wi-Fi and you can't do the elegant man-in-the-middle approach, the other one is the common one is phishing attacks, right? So everyone gets the emails. 
hey, your account, PayPal, I've been getting slammed with PayPal emails. Hey, we see sus suspicious activities. And when you look at the spelling of the URL, it is not PayPal. It's some weird characters that are in there. Um, so again, now don't take the whole thing. Leave me. Yeah, take 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 a few from each bag, but you know, leave me enough to hang out. Yeah, yeah. There we go. The greenish ones are glow in the dark. If you want some of them. I think I like we them. we uh, let some other talking happen, and then we do our other thing. Okay. Uh, let's open up for questions on that specific um, that specific demonstration right there, and you can ask some general questions if you want to, and then we can go to possibly another demonstration. Just point out, uh, I said it was real easy to copy and paste a, a web page, uh, so like a couple minutes before the panel, I copied the Facebook login page. If you check the URL, you'll find this one is being hosted on my laptop, and it looks pretty much the same. Nothing terribly magic there. Does anybody? Uh, Mueller? Anyone? No, yeah, come up to the mic. If you have questions, form a line at the mic real quick. Right, uh, so you're saying that out-of-date browsers could forge that little icon, right? What was the mechanism that uh, they used that was, that was passed with so the newer? Out of date uh, web pages okay. tend okay. to have this icon shown right. because they don't have the uh, signature that you need in order to show the, the lock without the, the cross. Okay, so, uh, so uh, sorry, I thought you were saying that, uh, that an older browser meant that the malicious site could, could actually forge that. But I, I mean, that might be true too, but it's a different story. Got it. Okay, so it's just the certificates are out of date. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. So uh, my question's about, I've heard a lot about VPNs being used to help prevent man in the middle attacks. Can you guys explain the mechanism by how that helps? So if you are accessing a site that has no signature, uh, so in particular you, you might access a website that's just not very good at updating, such as my website, <laughs> uh, and you'll find that Chrome even is telling me this is not secure. Um, then your only guarantee that you're actually connected to that server is if your ISP, and in fact all the machines in between you and, uh, and that server are honest. Right? If they wanted to, they could connect you to some scammer who could say, yeah, this is IsaacChef.com. It's uh, this login page where you give me all your credit card information. Um, so a VPN is telling you essentially that you're going to make a, a, a connection to us that involves digital signatures. So you know you're connected to us, and your internet will go through us. And we are very honest, and we are good at connecting to other honest machines. So if you believe that they are indeed honest, then they can help you prevent man-in-the-middle attacks in that form. This is important if you're worried about, say, your Wi-Fi provider, uh, say, uh, DragonCon, uh, <laughs> sneaking a, a man-in-the-middle attack in there. Well, okay, you know you don't get it if you go through the VPN, and you trust the VPN. Of course, if the VPN company itself is sketchy, they could be the ultimate man in the middle. And I got a comment on that. Um, Dustin and I were trying to get in touch with a mutual friend of ours, Andrew McElroy, who's done a lot of conventions in the past. Um, we haven't been able to get hold of him in about six months. We're getting kind of worried. Um, but last um, I talked to Andrew, he and some VC folks were setting up a VPN service in Singapore, and they've done a lot of research on their competitors and um, had a white paper they were preparing for release or legal people were going over with, with a fine tooth comb because they were going to show pretty conclusively that about 90 percent of the VPN servers out there are ultimately owned through a layer of shell companies by the Chinese Communist government and that could be really really interesting way to get um, dirt on people you want to blackmail later so yeah if you have the capability and wish to use a VPN when you're out and about, um, use something like OpenVPN and connect it to your house and, fi and pipe through your house's internet. That is also very useful for if you have a cell phone with unlimited uh, cell data, you can use that and uh, something called Easy Tether. And by using the VPN, you will be masking from the cell phone service that it's not mobile data, it's just garbled data and then there's really no way they can prove, except for, I guess, if you're using an ungodly amount of data, that you're not using it for mobile purposes. So you can sort of get around your mobile hotspot uh, dealing. 
I've if lost my home internet for years. Yeah, if you're doing anything at all that you would be not comfortable testifying under oath about, um, have separate identities for um, personal work, private lives, and never mix and match anything between them. So I'm going to add to that. Uh, well, one was I think absolutely. I think to, to simplify or to sum up some of the point here, if you use a VPN, you're exchanging who you trust to the VPN provider from the other source. So if you are in a place where it seems super sketchy, then maybe that, you know, is a better choice. But as I say, like, there's a lot of sketchy VPNs out there, and there may even be VPNs that start out not being sketchy and then get bought out by someone and turn sketchy. Most of the sketchiness on VPNs is they're just, like, actually gathering your data for marketing to you, which is a different form of sketchy than the Chinese government, but there's a lot of uh, sketchiness out there. So say, if you, if you are in a situation where you want to have uh, good identity protection, which is one of the things that, that VPNs can help with, uh, consider using the Tor browser, uh, which, uh, you know, uh, will, I think, provide a more robust uh, uh, protection from that. Um, you know, if you just want to change what country you're in so you can uh, use your streaming service when you're somewhere else, then, you know, maybe it doesn't, doesn't matter as much. Uh, and the other thing I just wanted to go, going back to our, our man in the middle with the HTTP and HTTPS, like, uh, that, uh, uh, one of the things I think is, is, is worth noting is in these outdated websites, it's very outdated at this point. There are surprisingly few websites that don't have uh, a, a certificate, um, and this has been a, a problem that was around for a long time. That uh, So many websites were unsecure. It's very easy for people to do the attack that you just demoed. Uh, and now it is harder and it's something that may be a little bit more surprising and some browsers will also say like are you really sure if there's something wrong with the uh, with the certificate uh, so we've made good security progress in um, and being able to, sh to show people how to use it and to to get people websites to to make it secure to avoid these kinds of attacks so one of the places I end up with those are you sure web pages all the time is when I'm out somewhere using the Wi-Fi and they have a captive portal, which is just the most annoying thing in the world for many reasons, one of which is the technology we just demoed is essentially what's used to give you a captive portal. Yeah, they um, are just a really shitty man-in-the-middle attack. So it's, it's, it's uh, not my favorite technology ever. One of the things I was going to mention with that is that... Uh, a little closer my, to the mic, please. Yeah, okay. Uh, when I was uh, at my previous employer, there was actually a little bit of an incident that I had to report because my ISP actually decided that it was going to indicate to me that I hadn't paid my bill by doing that kind of captive portal man-in-the-middle thing. So my security manager immediately got me a Mozilla VPN instance. <laughs> also, uh, you mentioned OpenVPN a minute ago. Yes. I'm also a big fan of WireGuard. That one's really good, too. Okay. How do we trust the certificate authorities? <laughs> be, paranoid, be paranoid because there is someone out there somewhere who is trying to get you for some reason. And you don't trust certificate authorities. Uh, generally, they are pre-programmed into your browser, and your browser trusts them. So you can program new CAs into your browser if you wish to, or you can just leave it like it is. But ultimately, you're trusting your browser to tell you that everything is hunky-dory. Mm. Unless things have changed in the last few years and, you know, technology changes faster than I can keep, keep up these days, a uh, good rule of thumb is um, use multiple layers of security. Don't depend on any one thing. Anyone who says they've got an all-in-one solution, especially if they want to sell it to you, is trying to sell you snake oil. Don't be the low-hanging fruit. Is there any A little closer to the mic, please. Keep the oh. mic, please. Apologies. Uh, is there any one particular VPN that you recommend for the Asian continent? Because my job constantly is sending me over there, and I've tried, like, the generic ones that they have for uh, phones and TV, or I'm not, sorry, not TV, but computers, um, and it's constantly causing problems for my family back stateside. And I just wondered if there was anything that I could do that was not going to cause issues with home station. That would be an Andrew question if we'd been able to get in touch with him because that's exactly what he was working on. <laughs> Sadly, uh, the other Andrew. Uh, Andrew McElroy, pardon me. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Okay. 
<laughs> I wish I could answer that question. I, I really do, but I don't have a good answer. No, I appreciate you. I have a USB for my work stuff that has a code listed on it, but I cannot use that for personal use because mm. of government reasons. <laughs> I don't know if so, this helps you at all, but Andrew McElroy, one of the last conversations I had with him, um, he said to assume pretty much anything you took into China was going to be compromised at some point. So basically you wanted to take hardware in and bring out that you weren't going to use again or that you were going to, at best, completely wipe, reformat, maybe even change the hard drive out. Yeah, you can't use anything in China. They have their own version of Google that completely locks down everything. I've heard the stories. Um, Science fiction, Canadian science fiction author, um, Dr. Peter Watts, Rifters.com, amazing website. Um, he documents some of his experiences going to um, officially sanctioned Chinese Communist government science fiction conventions in China. And he talks about some of the technology um, and the stuff he took over and the stuff they found on it when he got home in, uh, to Canada. So. You can't even see Disney fireworks for the Chinese YouTube just to put how controlling they are. Like, the only fireworks they will allow is the actual Chinese version we see with the red uh, fireworks all the way up that go pa -da -ba -da -ba -da. That is the only fireworks you will ever see. They don't allow anything else. Authoritarians so, uh, are going to authoritarian. They have so, a thing um, where they, they, Winnie the Pooh is a uh, <laughs> symbol of uh, the Chinese premiere, which is... Could, definitely appear in some China, uh, oh, yeah. Disney fireworks. It would be risky. So one of the last, uh, the, actually the last conference I went to before COVID, the professional conference, uh, I saw a, a presentation of a paper of people who were using machine learning to uh, automatically route around Chinese firewalls from inside the country, which was rather fascinating, um, but obviously was a, only a uh, proof of concept at the point. Um, Cult of the Dead Cow has been doing stuff in that area since the early 2000s and they had actually released some tools um, at some point that they demoed at DEF CON but again it's been years and I don't know what the state of the art is on that now but I would assume that some members of the CDC are keeping up on that they kind of pioneered a lot of uh, gray hat hacktivism. Speaking of uh, bleeding edge research solutions there was a paper a um, few years ago now on trying to get firewalls, basically, uh, trying to get VPN connections basically out of China in a way that was very difficult to detect, called Slavine, named after a Doctor Who monster. The premise was that uh, you need a participating ISP on the American side. So anyone in between you and some website that you're actually allowed to connect to outside of China from inside of China. And because HTTPS connections are not only signed, but they're encrypted, you can't really tell whether the information, at least if you're watching from the outside, like a firewall is, you can't really tell whether the information coming back is actually from the website or information from the, uh, the internet service provider. You can if you're requesting the website because you actually get to decrypt it, but you can't if you're the firewall. And the idea was that Slovene would just, you'd send it some kind of secret message, and it would just take whatever information you requested from the website and cut that off and send back whatever information it was you actually wanted. So you'd have your sort of fake web browser browsing websites that you're allowed to browse from inside of China, requesting lots of big files and whatnot. And then all those files would actually get replaced on the way back with whatever information it was you actually wanted. It would be nigh impossible to stop from a firewall perspective. I'm not sure how far Slowly never got into production, but you could try and find out. Audience Q&A? Anyone? You don't have to do questions just revolving around that. Any hacking questions you have, you're free to come up and ask. Remember, some of us take a really broad view of the term hacking. Mm -hmm. Hacking history questions are fun, too. Um, I'm just curious, uh, why do a lot of security researchers seem to hate Let's Encrypt versus <laughs> other SSL providers? That's not a me question. I, I like Let's Encrypt because it's free. <laughs> I think uh, it's let's source. I, mean, I didn't know that there were a lot of security so. researchers that didn't like uh, Let's Encrypt, but Let's Encrypt is 
has really helped make the world a better place by solving a critical problem. People didn't want to spend money on certificate authorities, and there were very few certificate authorities. They made it hard and expensive, and then Let's Encrypt became a, a free certificate authority. Uh, I mean, so, you know, full disclosure, you know, EFF is heavily involved in Let, Let's Encrypt, and uh, we make a program called CertBot, which is designed to make it quick and easy to uh, to get a certificate there. But I think there is a strong connection between um, between Let's Encrypt coming about uh, and the high percentage of websites that are now encrypted that were not before. I mean, there are other factors as well. Uh, search engines, uh, including being encrypted, uh, in terms for search engine optimization, giving a higher rank, gave a lot of incentive for people doing that as well. Um, but uh, I, yeah, so I'm, I think. Uh, very happy with with how Let's Encrypt has did, and since we're we're on the topic, I, I have to also take a moment to uh, give a pay my respects and a shout out to Peter Eckersley, a former colleague of mine who uh, passed uh, yesterday. He was uh, the one who had the idea of making a free certificate authority to solve for this this problem. And so, when you see a lot of these uh, encrypted websites uh, today, you know, raise a glass to uh, to Peter Eckersley. As, as someone who's utterly um, uninformed, because I've been doing like bio and genetic shit for the last two years, uh, could you give me the TLDR on Let's Encrypt? It's a free SSL provider. Oh. And it does a lot of great things. It's very simple, it's automated, it does just amazing things. But I'm guessing it's probably more FUD from the actual other CAs. Who are saying, oh, well, you don't do the whole identification piece or something like that. That's what I normally have heard. Yeah, my ill-informed opinion is that's actually pretty cool. Yeah. Oh, so it is. Very cool. Here's here's my, uh, so I'm not aware of people, at least in the academic uh, uh, security community, really hating Let's, Let's Encrypt. Uh, but if, I, if, if there are some that do, I can make an educated guess as to why, which is uh, similar to what you were just saying. So there's two purposes to these sorts of encryption. One is... Uh, um, to give some sort of uh, confidentiality guarantees. So we talked, I talked earlier about confidentiality and integrity. Uh, some sort of confidentiality guarantees, like you don't release the data, your data to the Chinese government. And some integrity guarantees, like you are who you say you are. And Let's Encrypt doesn't actually check that you are who you say you are. So they're signing this thing saying, yes, I know that you are this person. All they know is that you're the person who signed up for that. Well, they, well, they know well, that sorry. you're the person who's in control of the domain that they're, you're signing. Right, you right, right. prove that who you are as like an individual, uh, but that you are in control of the domain that you're getting a certificate for. Right. But I suspect that what's going on is that they want stronger integrity guarantees than what Let's Encrypt is able to provide. Um, but I, I think, as has been pointed out, it's not like they provide none. And I think we should all be glad that there's more rather than less in the world. So... My ill-informed first opinion has been modified. That's cool, but there's more that could be done. So to, to be clear, to fill in anyone who might not be following along, um, the purpose of certificate authorities is uh, to distribute the signing power for the same SSL certificates you use to validate that a website is actually the website you wanted and not just some imposter. And um, therefore, you have to, to some extent, trust some set of certificate authorities <laughs> to hand out those certificates to the people who really do quote unquote run those websites and then to some extent defines who runs those websites so should you trust let's encrypt well to the best of my knowledge as someone who uses actually the eff software you just named and let's encrypt on the actually htbs version of my website um we uh they make that determination by running their own clients who occasionally try to fetch your site and check to see that uh you are in control of the site that they receive. So in principle, if some malicious hacker were in between all of my servers and Let's Encrypt's uh, verification clients, then they could fake who's in control of my website for purposes of Let's Encrypt. I don't know if other service providers do it differently because I'm not willing to pay for them. <laughs> and that's why Let's Encrypt is useful. Thank you all so much. Hi. Um, Are you doing something with? As no. like cybersecurity and uh, you know has become more uh, robust <laughs> and you know there's more authentication and things like that. 
Have y'all seen a rise in sort of uh, the social engineering aspect of it? And if so, like, what are some of the things that people should look out beyond just, like, the phishing emails and things like that? Like, what are some of the, like, newer tricks or things that are coming out that people are trying to use to social engineer, like getting your password or whatever? So I suspect Johnny knows a lot more than I do, but I have to say, I still get Nigerian uh, print scams. You don't need new technology for social engineering a lot of the time. Some of the phishing stuff has gotten really, really good and really convincing looking. Um, uh, my mom had a stroke early in COVID, and she's mostly recovered, but I kind of handle the household finances now, and I get a lot of uh, her coming to me with her laptop going, is this legit or is this another scam? And I'll be like, okay, here's how you tell. Remember, I explained this part. No, this is actually from Amazon. And let me see the, oh, no, that's total bullshit. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Mom. Cool. So you're a student. You probably get some of these, too. I get all the time uh, emails from my department chair um, or from from uh, when I was a grad student, I used to get them from my professor saying, oh, I really need you to bring me some Amazon gift cards right now. <laughs> Okay, that's interesting because um, I haven't seen anything like oh, that. Oh, they're really yeah, common in academia now. I haven't, I haven't <laughs> we get them. anything like that in my uh, .edu emails. My, my Maybe executive lucky. director needs a lot of gift cards. Yeah, <laughs> I did see one that was kind of neat um, uh, regarding Facebook uh, and you know multi-factor authentication, right? That's all the rage. Everyone's doing that. And so on Facebook, you have that naturally. You know, if you want to reset your password, if you have multi-factor set up. Uh, anyone ever get invite friend invites from family members and it's not their page it's not them right you see that all the time what they're doing uh, with that guys though is why they're doing that is eventually they'll send you a message and say hey uh, Aunt Mary I'm having trouble I lost my phone and I can't reset my my Facebook password do you mind if I send my reset code to you and they say oh sure go ahead but what they're doing is they're logging in as you and sending the reset code. It goes to it goes to that person, and then they say, "Okay, now give it to me." And then they send that reset code back over to them, which is their own reset code. And so now they can log in and change their password under that user. Uh, so if anyone ever says, "Hey, do you mind if I do my uh, multi-factor reset through you?" Because I don't have, I can't get to my email. I'm locked out. Don't do that. They're trying to get your information, right? They're trying to log in as you. Uh, so that was kind of a clever one that's going around. That's pretty cool. Evil. Dustin, you, um, you're you a fan of the, the ones who lead on the scammers. There were a couple oh, of yes. folks you were talking about, a couple of folks we'd like to get here at some point. Oh, yes. Um, who's familiar with scam baiting? Who does scam baiting? Oh, a couple hands, hands up. Cool. Down. We want to talk to you afterwards. Who does scam baiting securely? <laughs> uh, this can be a good topic for hacking 201 uh, but for those who don't know scam baiting uh, you ever get those calls like oh your car warranty is expiring or uh, this is agent Bob from the IRS uh, and ultimately it leads to can you go get us gift cards uh, to pay your IRS bill uh, completely asinine, but people fall for it, unfortunately. Unfortunately, it's usually the elderly or, shall I say, those that don't have the intelligence about some stuff that they should. Or just less technically inclined. Well, less technically inclined, but I'm, okay, yeah. we'll, we'll go with we'll that. We'll be kind. Yeah. Uh, but if you know about this, maybe your parents could be susceptible to one of these scams you need to let them know about it. You need to educate them on it because I don't think you want them to get scammed out of $40,000, which does happen. Yeah, and some of the guys who explain this, they've got um, YouTube channels, and uh, they're both educational and hilarious, and this is something really good to um, point your older relatives or your less technically inclined relatives and friends towards and tell them, you know, watch this videos and just you know, be aware of this stuff. There's some evil people out there. Can we plug YouTube videos here or should we not? What do you think? Uh, if it's a useful resource, why not? Okay. Uh, anybody heard of Kit Boga? Uh. <laughs> Has anybody actually seen the Felicia Day Kit Boga um, where they worked together on one? She, yeah. she was playing his wife. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, I haven't seen that one. That's cool. Uh, go yeah, look at that one. Fine. It is good. All right. Let's get a couple more audience uh, questions here because folks have been waiting very patiently yes. here, and we appreciate it. And we can ramble on at times. So <laughs> if you get impatient, just say, yo, I got a question. Shut the fuck up. No, I mean, it, for me, it's very interesting to see that because working with uh, clients, like the general public of clients, we deal with a lot of people who are, say, they're not technically inclined, and the social duty aspects of it we deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, and we have to say, this is a scam, um, especially with redirects to, uh, what is it, Microsoft saying that you need to call them. Yeah, this is probably one of the biggest ones. But I know we were talking about like different browsers with the different um, uh, authentication security, um, just starting going back to school for cybersecurity and networking. I learned about DuckDuckGo and as a web browser compared to like Google Chrome, Edge, Unfortunately, well, not fortunately. Fortunately, Internet Explorer's gone. But um, and then Mozilla, like, what do you, what are your guys' opinions on a web browser like DuckDuckGo as like a primary use for your stuff? Sorry, I'm confused. I thought DuckDuckGo was a search engine. Search engine. It is. A search you can you can Basically. download it on like your phone for as like a per, like yes. a web browser. Yeah, yeah. they started. Making are you sure browser. you're not talking about the Brave web browser? Nope. No. No? Okay. No, they, they made a way for yeah. For me personally, um, I use Firefox and I use pretty much every um, ad block, script block, flash block isn't really a thing anymore, but uh, lock it down hard. I also use host files and um, uh, yeah, I very rarely see ads and I don't let scripts run unless um, I specifically whitelist them and that cuts down on a lot of bullshit. Um, by the way, Chrome, if uh, y'all haven't heard, they're seriously debating um, uh, pretty much banning or blocking. I'm not sure how they're going to do it, but preventing ad blockers from working on Chrome. So as a former uh, Google employee, um, employee, fuck you, Chrome, I'm, yeah, that's more motivation for me to not use Chrome. Yeah, that would actually push me off Chrome. I've been far too lazy to change browsers. <laughs> Oh, and I will put a comment in here um, because, yay, Linux, I've actually gotten my 79-year-old um, mother who is recovering from a stroke using Linux Mint now, and she thinks it's great. She has no problems with it. Of course, you know, web browsing and email is pretty much all she does, but uh, she loves it. She loves the fact that she doesn't have to see ads everywhere, and when I need to log in remotely and do stuff under the hood, Makes yeah. life very easy. Modern day Linux is perfectly good for a day to day user as long as you don't have to do hardcore business applications. That's the one killer. Are area. you saying this is the year of Linux on the desktop? Uh. <laughs> I'm not saying that. I'm just saying it works for me and my 70 year old mom who's recovering from a stroke. So why aren't y'all using it? We passed the year. It could have been year on Linux, the year of Linux on the desktop years ago yes. and still isn't there. So. <laughs> So um, I want to start by saying I'm a telephony engineer, and I'm sorry about that. Um, but uh, what, you're sorry about what? I'm a telephony engineer. I work phone systems. Um, Dude, so, phone freaking rocks. It, it does, but that opens up. Uh, that, that's actually kind of the core of my question. So, um, a, a, a phone freaking was one of the first ways that hacking really caught on in the general public. It was fantastic. Yeah. Um, so, uh, kind I still of got my old red box. <laughs> wow, <laughs> I haven't seen one of those in years. Um, anyway, um, so a, a lot of when we talk about security and hacking, we, we focus a lot on software and we focus on specifically IP. Um, but if you start thinking of uh, other uh, other types of networks and other uh, and other vectors, hacking gets fun. Um, so two two things kind of I want to call out is that um, uh, an obscene amount of the medical industry run, runs on fax, which is just all over the phone system. Oh, it's and so the bad. phone system is completely non-secure in every way, um, to a terrifying extent. Um, and the an another thing to bring up is um, we talk about software, but hardware is fun too. USB devices are considered first-class citizens because they're input devices, so you can do lots of fun stuff with that. Can you guys talk about your favorite um, kind of? other vectors to play with when, when it comes to hacking and security? I mean, there's the USB rubber ducky. Yes! Which has been making news recently. It's my favorite. <laughs> um, I mean, so this takes advantage of that USB first class uh, thing you just brought up, but basically... Oh, it's a clean sock. <laughs> um, Thank you very much. But basically the, the, the concept is you get a small device that pretends to be a keyboard. Um, 
computers don't want to make it difficult to plug in the keyboard, so it starts typing away. And uh, they managed to figure out a few ways to exfiltrate data out of the computer. Not a lot of data is sent from the computer to the keyboard, so it's pretty much whether or not caps lock is on. But uh, they managed to figure out a sequence of key presses that takes advantage of a number of interesting properties of several major operating systems, Mac or Windows or whatever that you might plug it into, and more or less is targeted to start exfiltrating passwords through this admittedly very slow channel of whether caps lock is on or not. You can make this a little bit harder with, uh, I want to say, Doom Cable is a USB rubber ducky pretending to be a charging cable for the iPhone. It's also got a teeny little Wi-Fi chip in there. So when it needs to send those passwords out, it can actually connect to the internet in a lot of cases and uh, just start emailing them. Um, an old school one, which sadly it was a lot of fun to play with at the time, but it's not really that common anymore, is... Uh, obsolete printer protocols. Oh my God, you could do so much fun stuff. Even if you have access to nothing else on the network, um, start scanning for the printers and then sending all sorts of fantastic churches of sub genius propaganda to uh, major religious organizations, um, Fortune 500s. Yeah, that was fun. Um, the newer stuff, this one pretty much freaked me out. It's low bandwidth, but I think, um, if I remember correctly, Mossad figured this out and put a paper out on it, so they'd probably been using it for quite a while. Um, lots of Internet of, uh, uh, Internet of Things devices are released and you know, never upgraded, so um, compromising cameras is kind of a, a fun thing to do, and if you can compromise cameras in data centers, they were... I don't remember the details. They were doing something with Cisco routers, and they hadn't completely compromised the router. This was based on some of Mike Lynn's research back in 2005 when he was the speaker at Black Hat. Uh, Google that. That's pretty amazing stuff. Cisco Apocalypse. And they were managing to, while not taking control of the router, they were getting control of the LEDs on the router. So they had the compromised cameras, and if they could find the routers that were in view of the cameras, they could exfiltrate information simply by blinking the LEDs like analog modems, low bandwidth, but set it up to run 24-7. Yeah, that's pretty wild stuff. I'll have to dig up the white paper on that and get it to Scott or whoever can put it up on the DragonCon website. So, yeah, those are my favorites. Has anyone here heard of the Spectre attack? Okay, um, I see a lot of people, a few people saying yes, a, a lot of people looking at me blankly. Uh, the Spectre attack was a big deal a few years ago. It, it's still a big deal, but it came out a few years ago. Um, so essentially, your CPU, right, you have your, your computer memory uh, and your CPU. Your CPU is the thing that thinks, and your computer memory is the thing that remembers. Um, but your computer memory is kind of far away from your CPU in terms of uh, electricity. So uh, you put some memory much closer to the CPU. That's called cache. And you don't have a lot of memory there because uh, you, you need it to be fast. So it's very easy to, uh, so you tend to forget things that are there and just store the memory. Um, so when you look for something in cache and it's not there, it's called a cache miss. And it turns out that by um, cleverly uh, looking at the timing of how long it takes people to retrieve public data, they were actually able to tell um, whether the, whether certain information was in cache or not. Um, so what they do is they manage to look at whether or not certain secrets put things in cache, and if they did, they could figure out what the secret is. And they actually started being able to use this to get people's public keys out, which is pretty crazy. <laughs> Public or private? Uh, private. No. Private keys. Sorry, I said public keys. Yeah, yeah. I meant private keys. Sorry, I was got right on it. Let's try to get these last two folks in because I think we're about 10 minutes. Oh, out. you're right, no, yes. Not, yeah, sorry, we, we talk a lot. Again, we're if we're talking too much, just tell us to <laughs> shut the fuck up and ask a question, please. Okay, well, now I'm here, though. Uh, we've all been told and um, told again and again uh, that uh, not to open emails uh, because uh, from places that you don't know because they will uh, explode you or do something like that. But... Uh, uh, I, I never understood exactly how that works. I, I'm, I'm assuming that uh, just uh, opening the email to look at it 
doesn't do anything, but uh, that instead what would uh, harm you would be uh, clicking on some kind of attachment. That, that's in particular, uh, I assume it would have to be an executable file. But Yeah, that's part of it. My understanding, and this is Microsoft crap and I don't do uh, Windows much, is that Outlook and some of their other mail clients can automatically execute stuff unless you tell specifically not to, and that's where the problem can come in. Mozilla Foundation makes a web, uh, pardon me, an email client called Thunderbird that also has plugins that will automatically block scripts and images and all that stuff so you can look at the raw text and not send any in information back to the originator and decide if you want to go ahead and load images and do the rest of the stuff. And it, um, makes it very easy to tell if something is a uh, scam or bullshit or if it's legit. Thunderbird. So, uh, uh, free no, open source. I, I, I used to use it. It's, it's just harder to use than uh, Outlook is accepted everywhere. Uh, yeah, but Outlook it, sucks, man. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so, so there is there is a way that looking at emails can pull information out of you, at least a little bit, um, which is, I mean, it's something you went over very quickly, but it it's images in the email. Uh, in particular, a lot of the time when you receive an email, it can have an image in it that is not sort of included. Yeah. The content of the image is not actually included in the email itself. It's something it fetches when you look at it. So you open it up and, and uh, your your email client says, okay, there's supposed to be an image here. That image is, you know, isaacchef.com slash cats. And it fetches isaacchef.com slash Well, if I'm isaacchef.com, I can see that someone is fetching isaacchef.com slash cats. So if I send everybody a different uh, image URL, then I know which ones of you opened that email and looked at the image in it, unless you've got images turned off in your email client. And uh, that can start to pull some information out. I, I think they, uh, most providers, though, now that it goes through a proxy through the email provider, so when you open it, it doesn't actually go to the target website, it goes through, say, like Microsoft's mail provider. Right, but even so, yeah. if I sent you a unique URL, I know which ones were fetched. And that can start to pull out some information. Yeah, if there's a tag on it or so at the end of it. Did that, did, uh, that answer your question? Uh, pretty much, <laughs> but uh, again, uh, uh, suppose you take something that's not an executable file, clearly not, like uh, uh, text TXT or uh, art, art rich text or... Uh, uh, or, or yeah. I, I don't know. Uh, I, I would have thought that, that uh, uh, images were not executable, but who knows? Uh, well, if you've got like a, a one pixel transparent um, uh, you know, pixel in there and it's linked to a specific what? URL, you sitting on the server there can tell who's accessing that one specific pixel. But, uh, I think what you're trying to get at is, is the danger of opening emails, and in particular attachments with emails. Right. And there are some kinds of attachments, like an EXE, that, that you know, are known to be dangerous. Also, people have had some, some uh, like malicious macros built into PDFs uh, from time to time. They try and fix up the PDFs to not allow that. An image, if, you know, there, there occasionally have been... Uh, O'Day type attacks where like a maliciously crafted image can cause problems, but that is you have to have a threat model that someone who's willing to use a expensive attack on you is, is worthwhile. So you know, for most people's threat model, that kind of uh, attack is unlikely. Mm -hmm. But if you are getting a message from a stranger, you know, use some caution with whether mm -hmm. you open the attachment, whether it makes sense. And you know, certainly be much more cautious for anything and that looks executable. One last thing: the the uh, ones that are <coughs> embedded in the images uh, is that that the uh, steganography uh, thing, or it, it can be, else? but they can also just be using the fact that you're looking at the image at all. Right? Well, we're, I think we're talking about different things, though, right? 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 It, the, not yeah, the yeah. so one is the revelation that you open the email, and that is commonplace using using the image. But a different thing is whether it will like cause malware on your computer. Right, and that um, can be done through steganography um, for sure. Yeah. Let, um, let me jump in here real quick. I apologize, but we got about four minutes, three and a half minutes left. But uh, yeah, definitely um, hacking two hundred one. We can go into more depth on this. It's just we're limited on time now, and I want to get this last gentleman who's been waiting very patiently. So obviously, uh, cloud infrastructure is huge nowadays. A lot of companies are switching to that from over from like a traditional data center. Um, even Amazon allows you to hack your own services there, a couple of them without even prior approval. Um, I was just wondering if any of you guys ever um, attempted to do so and how that compares to a traditional data center or like uh, the other cloud providers, AWS, Google Cloud, uh, you know, Microsoft Azure. 
It's interesting. I used to work for Google, and I was um, one of their data center engineers. And even back in, uh, what was it, 2003, 2005, they were working on a scale I'd never seen before. It was freaking amazing, but and, you know, God only knows what they're doing now. Um, I am working or uh, learning about the Amazon cloud services. I'm uh, In addition to school, I've got about a dozen certifications I want to have uh, before I graduate with my undergraduate degree in May in uh, Google Cloud Services are some of the ones I'm going through. And it's it's interesting, it's different. Um, I'll have a write-up, I guess, if anyone's interested for Next Dragon Con on my physical data center experiences versus Google Cloud services. Um, but uh, there's probably people here who've got more experience with cloud than I do right now. I just wanted to put in my two cents as an old school data center rat. Yeah, it's, uh, they've definitely made it easier now for testing. Uh, Back in the day, we used to we wrote software to hack websites, you know, for you, and AWS was killing us. But now, uh, and we worked with them over time to say, hey, look, there's got to be a way that our customers can test their websites that are being hosted in AWS, and so they now have an official way to do that. So if you go onto AWS, say, hey, I want to run a security scan. Uh, there's a form you fill out, and it'll open up for a time frame to say, hey, we want one week. And during that one week, you can blast your website with all kinds of attacks, and it's all okie dokie, and everyone's good with it. So, uh, AWS does have a, a process to go through to officially do that. It's so much fucking fun. People used to go to jail for that shit, and now you right. can do it legally. <laughs> right. I suppose uh, my question specifically is: I would assume that AWS, you know, all of these guys, this is what they do day in day out, um, and that the easiest. Uh, approach would be to find like to social engineer and get you know someone's password as opposed to actually breaking through an encryption or any other sort of security system especially when it comes to like these cloud providers who are well you know if ada if amazon got hacked that's that's pretty bad consider you know yeah. like that's um so I, I suppose that's that would be the case on like it's surprisingly easy to find secret sprawl's a bitch <laughs> Uh, uh, I would how much time help. we got left? Uh, 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 we got like we, we yeah, literally have thirty seconds. Yeah. Yeah. Um, hacking two hundred one is what tomorrow night. Tomorrow is it at ten o'clock here. Uh, yes. Is it here? yes. Cool. Yeah, we can talk about fun stuff like basically the Ring negative three uh, level Minix um, operating system that runs inside your Intel CPUs and how everyone is vulnerable if you use in Intel anything for the last ten years. <laughs> Log for J demonstration too. We'll do that. Hack a website running a vulnerable log, log for shell uh, exploit. We'll go over. <laughs> we'll go over scam baiting as well. All right, googly eyes. We'll step outside so the next uh, group can get in here, and I'm more than happy to give away stuff, go cause uh, fun chaos, and have an enjoyable rest of the con if we don't see you again. Thanks, everybody.